we can start with the current okay. So, shall start. Today we are going to talk about synthetic cuts in topological string theory. And this talk, and also the title of this talk, is based on a really recent work by Dr. Cassia, Peter Longhi, and Maxim Perzin. And the paper is called Synthetic Cuts and Open. What I say today may be par a partial result of. Uh, their, their actual achievement claim um, that they were able to provide in several examples and we are going to consider indeed uh, as say final step of today's presentation one of uh, this example actually the most simple one that is just uh, the plain uh, c3 so what uh, they were able to provide is a uh, concrete relation between the closed Gromovitian invariance of a, Klabi, a toric Klabiau threefold uh, at genus zero with uh, the open Gromovitian invariance, uh, again, at genus zero of one of uh, uh, the special Lagrangian submanifold of this Klabiau uh, manifold. In particular, this is important uh, uh, because we know that to define open Gromovitian invariance, we have to provide uh, a submanifold uh, okay, that uh, satisfies certain uh, conditions that will give us this special Lagrangian uh, submanifold. And this is in order to be able to uh, give uh, yeah, say, a boundary condition on the topological strings that are compatible with uh, uh, the submanifold. So this will give us uh, the so-called uh, a brain of our topological model. So we are going to review some key steps that they show in this article and uh, other previous article by the same authors. The first one is the, the, the fact that the quantum equivalent volume that we are going to briefly review of uh, our Klabiau manifold encodes the genus zero closed Bramovitian invariance. And this has been claimed on uh, this paper by Cassia and Zabzin together with uh, Nicolo Piazzalunga. Next, uh, we come to this paper and we see that this, let's say, relatively new uh, symplectic construction called symplectic cutting it, uh, is used to provide uh, some sort of uh, Lebesgue measure to to the quantum equivalent volume of the world manifold. But not only that, they, they were able to establish a non-canonical relation between every choice of cut, I mean, uh, say, a class of, uh, of symplectic cuttings and uh, special Lagrangian sum manifold. And this is, let's say, uh, the main ingredient to establish this connection between the uh, closed and open Gromovitian invariants, because we have, uh, have to be able to uh, provide, uh, to associate to any symplectic cuts uh, a Lagrangian sum manifold for our uh, brain to be supported to in. And finally, the last part uh, of the story is that this uh, Lebesgue measure associated to the symplectic cutting not only uh, encodes the closed Glomovitian invariance of the whole manifold, but also the open Gromovitian invariance of the Lagrangian submanifold hell. So the outline of today's talk would be as follows. We have a first brief introduction to both the classical and the quantum equivalent volumes. Next, we are going to provide these symplectic geometry tools, namely, we will review the definition of Lagrangian submanifold, and we will finally talk about symplectic cuts. And then we will see how all this machinery comes together in this example of, uh, I was saying, almost trivial example, but still uh, we can say something in the case of uh, C3 with the standard symplectic uh, structure. So we start uh, with the setting. We immediately specialize to the case of uh, a toric Klabiau uh, trifold. So we need to review, let's say, the general construction of this kind of manifold that can be obtained uh, by just uh, looking at a, uh, a C3, C to the 3 plus, plus 3 uh, with uh, the standard symplectic structure uh, with an U1 to the R acting on it. And we require this action to be Hamiltonian. And in general, this condition is just given by a choice 
of the so-called charge matrix, this, this Q, that basically is just giving us uh, uh, an embedding of U1 to the R inside uh, the canonical U1 to the R plus 3 acting on C to the R plus 3. So this action is a Hamiltonian, and we know that we can take the so-called symplectic reduction with respect to it, and by the Marsden-Weinstein theorem, we are guaranteed that uh, we get, as a result, a new symplectic manifold, let's say for general values of the, the, parameter, the parameter t, that is called the Keller modulus. Indeed, we can have that uh, the value of t greatly uh, Chain. The, the geometry of uh, our symplectic reduction depends on this value of t. But in general, not only it depends the, say, I call it, I've been calling it uh, a Keller modulus because this modifies the Keller structure of our manifold. But not only that, we have also that uh, uh, for the so-called chambers, if we take uh, uh, the Keller modulus to belong to different chambers that are regions uh, in which the the codomain of our moment map is splitted, we will have different kind of geometries. For example, we could have that in some regions our uh, symplectic reduction is actually a smooth manifold, while in other regions we could just have that uh, uh, we get an orbifold because the action is uh, only locally free and not free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on the action. In this case, in this case, we, we are valued in R to the R. Yes. And uh, as I was saying, we are interested in Calabi-Yau manifold. So we also have to uh, enforce the calabi condition that is in the, in the toric case is equivalent to asking that the uh, columns of the charge matrix sums to zero. And this has, among other things, the, the consequence that our calabi will always going to be non-compact. So before I was saying, uh, I was talking about equivariant volumes because we need a way to regularize the infinite volume that the infinite, let's say, symplectic volume uh, that our manifold will always going to have. And so we consider, uh, I mean, since our manifold is toric, we always have a toric action on this, of the dimension equal to, let's say, the complex uh, dimension of our manifold, so in this case, three, and we are choosing one uh, sub, uh, subgroup, uh, one parameter subgroup of uh, our u1 to the three, and we call this the equivariant action that is specified by these parameter, parameters epsilons that gives this uh, uh, Hamiltonian action that uh, with moment map uh, h epsilon that in a suggestive wave way we call the Hamiltonian because now we can define this integral and we say that, that this is the equivalent volume of our manifold. Basically we are just, uh, in some sense, we are defining it uh, as the standard symplectic volume but we are replacing the symplectic form with the uh, equivalent symplectic form. And why is this a volume? Why do we call this equivalent volume? Uh, because I mean, just taking, okay, this is never going to be the case I was, as I was saying, but if uh, X were to be compact, then we could just put epsilon equal to zero, our uh, moment map uh, is equal to zero, and then we recover the symplectic volume. This is basically the idea. So uh, we need a more practice formula uh, for this equivalent volume and uh, I mean, we can show that this is equivalent up to uh, an overall, uh, overall normalization constant to the previous expression, but now this is way more easier, way easier to compute. I just need to say what is this uh, contour we are integrating over. This is called the Jeffrey Kirwan uh, contour. I will going to say something about this later in our example, but uh, uh, let me just say that uh, it is just a pres prescription depending on the chamber of uh, the relevant poles to, to compute the integral. And what's uh, really nice about this form and that we could uh, compute exactly the, the integral. And actually I could provide you with the formulas, but 
they are not going to provide us with uh, uh, additional insight about this. So first, why it is called equivariant? Because I mean, in this last, uh, in this last formula is clearly equivariant with respect to the U1 action. And as I was saying, it is a regularization of the generally infinite volume of our flabby gauge threefold. And since the Jeffrey Kier one uh, contouring, contour prescription depends on the chamber, we can show that uh, the expression for uh, for the equivalent volume will depend also on the chamber. Namely, it won't just depend on the parameter t. It will even the form of uh, our result will depend on the choice of the chamber, and this is important. Okay. Next, we introduce this uh, uh, quantum deformation of this equivalent volume. And basically, what we are doing is just to replace uh, uh, our manifold with a gauge linear sigma model from uh, an open disk to, uh, in this case, to uh, C to the R plus 3 with the gauge group uh, E1 to the R specified again by the same charge, charge matrix Q. In, in this way, we can uh, show that uh, this model flows at uh, low energies uh, to a, a nonlinear sigma model to uh, we target our Klabia manifold XT. So we can uh, take the, disk part the partition function of this theory and uh, we define uh, this as the quantum equivalent volume of our manifold. Now we see that now uh, we also have uh, dependence on another parameter that they call lambda that just parameterizes the uh, U1 action on the disk, since we have this additional symmetry. And also we'll play, let's say it plays also the role as the uh, one over H bar, where H bar we think of it as being the, the quantum deformation parameter. Indeed, if we take it to, uh, to be, if we take the limit as lambda, lambda goes to infinity, we're we recover the say, classical equivalent uh, volume, and this follows by just uh, the properties of gamma functions. Uh, next, uh, we see that now our contour is called the quantum Jeffrey Kier one uh, prescription. And I mean, this is just a generalization, but let's say, uh, let me say that the idea is that, uh, well, before, uh, before we had, uh, uh, say this kind of factors at the denominators and those were given rise to poles, to simple poles. Now, gamma function have uh, infinite towers of simple poles. One, we call it the classical pole because it's the one for the argument going to zero. That was the one we had for our Jeffrey Kier one description in the classical case. And now we define this quantum Jeffrey Kier one by saying that if, uh, uh, let's say the classical pole belongs to the Jeffrey Kier one, then both the classical pole and the infinite towers of poles uh, will belong to the quantum Jeffrey Kier one uh, prescription and vice versa. In doing it, in evaluating this uh, partition function, since we are considering a gauge, lin uh, linear, gauge linear sigma model uh, from a a manifold with boundary, namely the C2, uh, the, the disk, we need to provide, to choose uh, boundary conditions for our, uh, for our fields. In this case, uh, and this will play a fundamental role later, we choose uh, uh, Neumann boundary conditions for every field in such a way that this corresponds to the so-called space filling brain solution, because uh, uh, Let's say uh, the fields we are putting our uh, boundary condition on are the say uh, we we are putting boundary conditions on the Kiron multiplex of our of our theory and the lowest component of these multiplex are actually the components of the map uh, the maps phi providing the embedding of the disk inside the target manifold and so. Putting the uh, Neumann boundary condition on these uh, fields means that the boundary can be, uh, the boundary of the disk can be mapped in 
to any point of the, the, the target manifold in such a way that we get that any possible embedding of a brain is, let's say, is provided by this theory. Oh, and then this product of uh, gamma functions came from the uh, one-loop determinant of, uh, of the chiral multiplets and indeed it depends on the choice of uh, uh, boundary condition we made. Now, a uh, really non-trivial claim that is, let's say, the result of a former, former papers by uh, the one I was sitting before, by uh, Luca Cassia, uh, Niccolo Piazzalunga and Maxim Zazin, is that uh, uh, this equivariant uh, quantum volume captures the genus zero Gramovitan invariance of the manifold. And this uh, is a consequence of the choice of uh, boundary condition we put on our Gateway Linear Sigma model. Uh, I don't want to say much more about this. It would be another world presentation, but I mean, this is uh, a key point in the establishment of the relation between a closed and open Gromovitan invariance. Okay, next we we are finally going to see some symplectic geometry. And we start by, uh, say, a general study of U1 Hamiltonian actions on any symplectic uh, uh, manifold, M omega. And so we consider an Hamiltonian action defined by some moment method mu. And again, we know how to take the symplectic reduction, and we call this M0 depending on the Keller modulus T. Now we want to uh, split our manifold in three regions. Uh, the first one will be given by just the, uh, the level set of the moment map. And then this will uh, split the, uh, our manifold into connected regions that are the super level set, the one we called M greater, and the sub level set uh, M that will be M lesser. And we see this in a Really simple example, we just consider the diagonal action of an U1 acting on C2. Clearly, this is an Hamiltonian action with moment map just the uh, mod squared of Z. And so we can see that the level set for a given T uh, greater than zero is just diffeomorphic to uh, S3. While the super level set will be a product of S3 with the uh, positive half line and M lesser will be um, an open for ball. And this is a suggestive uh, image of this splitting inside the moment polytop of the C2. Now, we, we, need this, uh, say, we needed this little digression in order to uh, understand uh, the, the construction of the symplectic cutting. Uh, for the first step consists in defining another symplectic manifold out of the, the former. And we start by defining Z as the Cartesian product of our starting manifold M and uh, a factor C with the coordinate W. And we extend the symplectic form uh, on Z in, let's say, in the mo most obvious way. I mean, just by taking a direct sum of the two uh, symplectic form we had on each of those two factors. And now we can see that we have a choice of a two uh, really natural Hamiltonian action on this manifold Z. And we call them U1 plus, plus uh, or minus, depending if we choose uh, uh, the action that is basically the diag diagonal action on uh, on M with the previous U1 action and on C, which is either the, the action with weight minus one for U, U1 plus or weight plus one for U1 minus. And then we see that this is clearly Hamiltonian with respect to uh, these moment maps, nu plus or minus. Again, we have symplectic manifolds, we have Hamiltonian action on, on them. And we can define the symplectic reduction and we call this uh, m bar plus or m bar minus. Okay. 
And now we are ready to see the definition of the symplectic cutting. Uh, I've skipped uh, a little bit about, uh, say, the properties of those manifolds m bar ma plus and r m bar minus. But the important thing is that both of them, both of these two manifolds contain the symplectic reduction M0C of our starting manifold M with respect to the U1 action uh, as a divisor. And in particular, in our case, since we are interested in uh, a splitting manifold being also toric, this divisor is actually a toric divisor. And now that we have two different manifolds uh, uh, with a common divisor, we just define the splitting cutting procedure but as the the gluing procedure of those two manifolds along their common divisor, M0 to C. And this we, we call the sympathetic cut of the tripole M omega with moment map mu. We again consider the previous uh, example of a diagonal U1 action over C2. And in this case, we see that M bar minus is just uh, CB2. Since uh, we have we are taking the quotient of S3 with respect to the diagonal action of U1, M bar plus is the tautological bundle over over CP1, and maybe this is a little bit more involved, but basically we are adding, uh, let's say, the Z the C, on C2 we are having the uh, diagonal action of U1 because we are at weight one and one, so we are getting the P1. And then uh, we are building a line bundle with the correct uh, transition function using the factor, the coordinates w, because from we have weight minus one that gives the minus one of the line bundle over p1. And uh, as the symplectic uh, reduction, we just get the p1. And now clearly uh, this works uh, in this example works. Uh, because both uh, those two contains P1 as a divisor, right? In this case, we can see that uh, in CP2, the divisor is the one taken for W equal to zero, namely it is the uh, projective line at infinity. While in the case of the autological uh, bundle over P1, putting W equal to zero uh, recovers the uh, zero section of the bundle and so that uh, this P1 is just the exceptional divisor of the tautological bundle. So basically we are just gluing CP2 and uh, the tautological bundle along the, those two P1s they contain. And here there is this uh, uh, suggestive uh, uh, diagram where we can see we have on the Z1 mod square, Z2 mod square, we had just the previous uh, image of before, where, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Here we are. Where we are splitting the moment polytop in the two region of the uh, super level set and the sub level set. And we can see the sympathetic cutting uh, as a, say, a, uh, on a third axis, we have this, uh, the moment polytops of here of m bar minus and here of m bar plus glued along the, this P1 that is, I mean, in this image is, uh, would be the uh, moment polytop of P1. Okay, now we want to specialize this procedure uh, for the case of our interest, that is the toric clubby out threefold. But since uh, every uh, uh, toric action commutes with uh, another toric action, we can just define the spreadic cutting uh, at the level of the C to the R plus three before taking the quotient, because then we can see that everything descends to the quotient. So we want to specify a symplectic cut, but this is equivalent to specifying a U1 action over on C to the R plus three. And again, we before we had the charge matrix for specify such, such an action, but now since uh, the action is just the, of U1, we call uh, the charge matrix in some, sense, in some sense the charge vector of our action. And this will be a vector of integers inside Z to the R plus three. 
and then uh, this will have uh, the appropriate moment map uh, to show that this is uh, again an Hamiltonian action. As I was saying, this let's say the, the whole procedure of uh, constructing uh, the, the manifold before I called uh, m bar minus m, m bar plus at the level of c to the r plus three descends to the quotient when we take the quotient with respect to the u1 to the r uh, given by the charge matrix Q we had before. So in particular, we get that the symplectic capping is defined uh, as you can see, but we uh, mainly are interested in the symplectic reduction. So on this X zero, that we can write as the, let's say the quotient of the intersection of the two different uh, level set for the two moment maps. This one for the U1 to the R action and this one for the U1 action and we uh, quotient by the Cartesian product of the two different actions. Again, this works because everything commutes. This, uh, this remark may, be seem, uh, may seem a little bit uh, say, uh, useless in the start, but we will see that it has actually some consequence, consequences. And it is basically the fact that uh, the datum of a charge vector Q is completely equivalent to specify an hyperplane via this, uh, this condition inside the moment polytope of uh, C to the R plus 3. It is just uh, R, let's say, the uh, positive real half line to the R plus 3. Okay, now a really brief review about uh, Lagrangian sum manifold and special Lagrangian sum manifold. Uh, we have this fact uh, about uh, Lagrangian sum manifold in the toric setting. That, uh, that is uh, the following: that a toric Lagrangian sum manifold L of a Calabi-Yau trifold of a toric Calabi-Yau trifold is given uh, can be described as a U1-2 vibration over an affine line L inside the moment polytope of the Calabi-Yau. So this means that we Let's say for what we are interested in in the following, we just care about the, uh, the base space of this uh, vibration. And so we just have to give this uh, affine line L. But we can equivalently uh, give the affine li line inside the moment polytope of C to the R plus 3. So we just have to uh, enforce the condition that it is contained also in the moment polytope of X. And this is uh, done by, say, uh, requiring that uh, ZI uh, belongs to the level set of the moment map mu Q. And then we are left with two linear uh, conditions, independent, two linear independent conditions that are given by, again, two hyperplanes that we call H1 and H2. And we choose this uh, suggestive notation to, let's say, uh, give a relation uh, with uh, the charge vector we had before when we defined the symplectic cut. Okay, but we also, uh, we, as I said, we want L to be also special. That means that uh, the, uh, the top dimensional holomorphic, holomorphic form of the Calabi-Yau gets pulled back to a uh, volume form on the Lagrangian sum manifold. And this is equivalent to let's say, uh, some sort of calabi condition and, and that is uh, enforced by asking that the entries of the, char of the two ch so-called charge vectors sum to zero. Okay, now we have on one end the symplectic cut and on the other end the uh, special Lagrangian sum manifold and we want to recall the, their similarities. So in the case of the symplectic cut, we just had one hyperplane with no condition whatsoever on the choice of it. Well, on the special Lagrangian case, we had to provide two different hyperplanes. And also, since we want the, the submanifold to be special, we also have this condition on the hyperplanes. But a special Lagrangian submanifold for them, there is still some uh, ambiguity in defining the, uh, the upper planes. And uh, one can show that uh, we can always set uh, the constant C2 to be equal to zero. And then we are left with just one constant C1. 
and the same happens for the simplectic cut where where we had another constant c that was was uh, the killer modulus for the u1 quotient so uh, looking at, at these uh, uh, similarities between the two constructions the authors uh, gave some let's say some algorithm to uh, build out of a simplectic cut the associated special Lagrangians, Lagrangians and manifold that just amounts to setting H to be equal to H1. In particular, we are saying that uh, we, uh, we will just consider simplectic cuts that satisfy this condition for the hyperplane H. And uh, so this relation is not canonical at all, since we know that to give uh, a unique special Lagrangian sum manifold, we would also uh, have to provide a second hyperplane, but uh, uh, the authors claims that this doesn't play any role in the following, in establishing the relation with the open Gromovitan invariance of this Lagrangian sum manifold held. And now, finally, we want to say clarify a little bit uh, those construction, and we consider the easiest uh, possible example, the one of C3, that is indeed a toric Calabiao trifold. So uh, we can see that at first uh, the, the example seems to be quite trivial because uh, the equivalent volume of C3, uh, to compute it, we don't need to perform any integral since we don't have any U1 action for the definition of the Calabia we are considering, and so we get that this is just one over the product of the epsilon parameters. But what's important is that even if C3 is trivial, like for, uh, let's say, as a Calabia threefold, it still admits non trivial uh, symplectic cutting. In particular, we have considered the symplectic cutting given by. Uh, the U1 action specified by this uh, charge vector, 0, 1, minus 1. And indeed, we have chosen uh, the vector in such a way that uh, its entry is sum to 0 to, sp uh, to satisfy the, the condition I was talking about a moment ago. And in this way, our symplectic reduction that we call x0 will be a Clavier twofold for, general, uh, for generic values of the Keller modulus C. Now, what plays the crucial role in uh, establishing this uh, connection between the Gromovitan invariants is the equivalent volume of uh, the symplectic reduction of uh, X0C. And so, by definition, we have that this is, uh, say, the, the equivalent volume. And now we add to actually compute the integral. And, uh, Okay, let me just say a couple of words. So this is the definition of the JK pres uh, prescription in this case. So it's just the set of all possible indices i, such that the chamber we are fixing is contained inside the cone generated by the uh, ith element of a discharge vector q. So in the first case, okay, for our example, we have that... Uh, uh, the only non-regular value for the moment map is c equal to zero. And so c equal to zero splits our moment polytop into region, the, uh, the positive real numbers and the negative real numbers. So the first choice uh, amounts to uh, c equal the positive real numbers. And for it, we have that uh, the only relevant pole is uh, phi equal to minus epsilon two. And so we just have to compute uh, the residue of our simple pool. And we get this expression for the equivalent volume. And in the same way, we get an expression for uh, the second chamber, are uh, the negative uh, real numbers. And we see that, as I was saying before, our, the two expression depends on the choice of the chamber. They are actually different. But we notice that uh, at least they are continuous at c equal to zero. And this is no case, because now uh, our, uh, let's say, we can define this integral since uh, it is a continuous function. And, let's say, it may seem a coincidence, 
coincidence, but we can express, express the whole equivalent volume of C3 as the integral over all possible values of the Keller uh, modulus of the equivalent volume of the symplectic reduction of this H. So intuitively, this is some sort of, we are in some way foliating the C3 with, our, uh, with the symplectic reduction, even though this is not so obvious because the symplectic reduction is not a submanifold of, uh, of C3. And so we, we, the authors choose this uh, suggestive name of Lebeg measure uh, for H because it plays some sort of, uh, the role of some sort of measure for the, the, the equivalent volume of C3. Now we repeated the, the wall construction also in the, uh, in the quantum setting. Again, the quantum equivalent volume of C3 is trivial, meaning that we don't have to perform any computation. But we can also easily see that the limit lambda go, uh, going to infinity recovers the classical equivalent volume, as I was saying before. And then up to rescaling or equivalently setting lambda equal to one, we eliminate the lambda dependence of this uh, quantity. And we get that the quantum equivalent volume of C3 is just the product of gamma functions. But now we know that the relevant quantity is the quantum equivalent volume, not of C3, but of the symplectic reduction. And so we call this again H. And by definition, we have to perform this uh, integral. Again, it's just a matter of uh, compute uh, uh, the residues. This time they are infinite, but we are able to uh, resum over all, uh, all, uh, all the poles, all the residues. And I skip the computation, but the final result we get uh, are those two different uh, uh, expression for the two different chambers. But this time they actually are not different. We can, I mean, we can easily see that the expression is the same in the two different chambers. And this is, a, uh, say, a, a feature of the quantum theory. Basically, the, uh, the instantons are, say, the, the quantum fluctu fluctuations are killing the non-smoothness non at the change of, uh, of chamber at c equal to zero. <coughs> And again, we have this really non-trivial equality that the uh, quantum equivalent volume of C3 can be written in terms of this integral of the quantum equivalent volume of the symplectic reduction. And again, we, uh, we choose this uh, uh, suggestive notation of quantum measure for the, for the volume of C3. And now we, we use the claim we made before that uh, uh, the quantum equivalent volume of uh, C3 encodes the information about uh, its uh, genus zero Gromovitan invariance. And uh, basically, we are saying that since we have this equality, all the information about the Gromovitan invariance is uh, inside the quantum measure, the so-called quantum measure. And now we, we come to the final step that is to establish the relation of the quantum equivalent volume HD with the, the so-called open string superpotential. And so we have to specify an, a brain that will be supported on a special Lagrangian sum manifold. But now we know how to, uh, let's say, relate our symplectic cut to a special Lagrangian submanifold, and indeed this is given by two hyperplanes, and we, ch uh, we chose the first one to be equal to the hyperplane that was giving the symplectic cut. And for the second one, we just uh, uh, made an assumption based on what we know it has to satisfy, namely in this case the uh, the charge vector for the second hyperplane is given by one minus one. Uh, zero, so that it entries, its entries is sum to zero. And uh, finally, we came to, let's say, the, the main prediction of, uh, of this paper, that is uh, the fact that the instanton regular term of uh, this integral 
is equal to the genus zero open string superpotential. Okay, so what I mean by instant on a regular term is that uh, regular term means that we are just taking the limit as epsilon going to zero. And at the same time, we are also claiming that this is regular for epsilon going to zero. And on, uh, for the instanton part, we just mean that we are dropping all the terms that are polynomial in, uh, in the Keller modulus C. And so this claim is supported, at least uh, in our example, by the fact that we can actually compute this integral because we had an expression for uh, the quantum measure HD. And we can extract the instanton regular term out of it. And we get that this is the second polylogarithm of minus e to the c. And what's important is that this result coincides with the, uh, what was known from the previous literature. However, the, the paper then uh, claims that uh, this result holds in general for any example, let's say for any uh, toric uh, Calabia or trifold, and they provide uh, several examples of, uh, of this computation. And so the, the consequences of this claim are, are two. The first one is a little bit, uh, say, unrelated for, from uh, our, say, from the, the goal of this talk, but still it is important, and it is the fact that uh, in the literature are known some, some ways for extracting the superpotential are already known, but all of these procedures were dependent on the chamber. At least, uh, um, say, it was not uh, evident that they were not depending on the chamber, while this procedure is clearly independent uh, on the choice of the chamber. And this comes from the fact, uh, as I was saying, that uh, the quantum equivalent volumes is always independent on the chamber. So this is a, a first uh, important result. And uh, on the other end, we have, uh, in the end, the, the relation between open and closed Gromovitan invariants. Because if we uh, assume that the initial conjecture about uh, the fact that uh, quantum equivariant volumes uh, uh, containing the information about genus zero closed uh, Gromovitan invariants of the wall manifold, then we have that uh, establishing this uh, connection with the open string superpotential gives us also the information about the open strings, uh, sorry, about the open Gromovitan invariants of the Lagrangian submanifold, because uh, uh, basically by definition, this uh, superpotential is defined as being the partition function of a, a nonlinear sigma model from the disk to uh, the club Yao manifold, but with boundaries supported on the, the particular uh, Lagrangian submanifold we are considering. And uh, the name superpotential is just uh, say, suggestive of the fact that uh, this, this partition function also controls uh, uh, superstrings, uh, uh, say, the, the quantum corrections to the, sup the superpotential when we embed the topological string theory inside the type 2A uh, string theory. And so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for the attention. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, so we, yeah, we only, in the end, we just use the symplectic reduction. But uh, uh, what I think is that probably the symplectic uh, cutting will play a role in establishing uh, this uh, relation between spatial Lagrangian and symplectic cut. Uh, because uh, uh, the authors said that uh, this analysis of this relation, I mean, uh, of the role played by the second hyperplane defined, uh, defining the cut, uh, let's say, 
had rise, gave rise to some uh, technicalities that they, were going, they are going to, to deal with in the second paper. So probably that's the reason. I, I wanted, in any case, to, to give a, a, a quick definition of the symbiotic cutting procedure. But yes, in this, at, at least at first, it seems like uh, we just care about the symbiotic reduction. And of course, we, uh, I mean, we would also have to, to prove the, this relation in general, this relation in general, and probably this may depend on the, on the whole procedure of the symbiotic cutting. I don't know. Very happy. Okay, so we thank Thomas again.